Professor Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford University, where he is a professor of medicine and a professor of economics. Great to be talking to you, Jay. It's wonderful to be talk with you as well, Nick. It's taken too long. It really has. I um, would like to start off by asking you a little bit about your your ancient history, if I may call it that, uh, where you come from, your childhood, and uh, leading up to how you come to this unusual position of being a professor of both economics and medicine. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's a little bit boring, but it, I mean, I guess I'll tell it. I did. I I um, was born in India and I moved to the U.S. when I was four. Uh, my my uncle gave me a chocolate bar when I landed, and I, and I thought to myself, "This is a great country." Um, <laughs> um, I uh, studied medicine uh, and economics uh, as an undergraduate. I, I've always wanted to be a doctor. Discovered economics by accident. Uh, realized it was possible to use economics to inform deep questions in medicine. And that's how I sort of ended up with an MD and a PhD in economics. Uh, I've been at Stanford for uh, 34 years and I'm 52. So I, I mean, I was a student and as a professor for uh, 20 some years. Um, and I've been writing on health economics for uh, health economics and infectious disease health uh, policy and, and epidemiology for about that long as well. Wow. Okay. Um, how did you, how did it happen that you woke up one morning and said, there's something wrong here? I mean, I've been studying, uh, as I said, I've written on infectious disease policy. I, I've written on H1N1 flu, you know, 2009, um, which at the outset looked like a very similar epidemic, but it turned out to be much less severe, obviously. Um, and it was striking. I, and I didn't write, I didn't do any serology studies then, but back then I noticed this, the, the, the way that the literature evolved. The early reports report said that the, the fatality rate from this, it was really the reporting case fatality rate was on the order of one, two, three, even ten percent. I think from one, one report in Argentina, mm -hmm. and which you know it's like a mind. Uh, it's it's a world shattering epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, and then the serology studies came out. The serology studies, obviously, as you all know, is is a is a uh, is a is a study to see uh, how much antibody is prevalent in the population, which shows evidence that the disease was there. And in H one N one, it was a hundredfold difference lower. Uh, in, in terms of the infection fatality rate. So rather than a 1% infection fatality, a case fatality rate, it's a 0.01% mm. infection fatality rate. Mm. So mm -hmm. on that order, I mean, there's, there's obviously differences in studies. Mm. Um, and I thought to myself, when the, uh, this epidemic hit, I saw the 3% case fatality rate number the World Health Organization reported. Uh, and I thought, you know, what if this is just like that? Uh, I mean, it's a respiratory virus. It might be very similar to H1N1 in terms of its spread. Um, let's see. And to my surprise, there wasn't any studies that had been done that I knew of that, that attempted to do this. So that's how I sort of entered this area. So there, there, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that World Health Organization estimate because for me that was that that press conference was one of the moments when I knew that there was something uh, not right. Um, and there were a couple of things: the the degree, the, the steps taken to make sure everybody was terrified, including starting the conversation by speaking about Ebola, good dose of psychological priming, and then um, this conflation of flu, infection fatality rate, and coronavirus case fatality rate. And I, 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 that, that press conference made me go cold. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't watch the press conference, but I did see that 3.4% number. I thought that that is much higher yeah. than it than uh, it's likely to turn out, in part informed by my experience with H1N1 uh, and, and watching that epidemic. Uh, I mean, I, you know, but I, I, I didn't know at the time. I mean, obviously, and that, and that was what struck me is like we we're making these world changing decisions, literally world changing um, on the basis of not very good evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, I I, I I thought look look okay, well let's why don't we start to develop this evidence, um, and it, and it's um, actually it's been striking to me that uh, it's not just the 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 information that that that's provided by the World Health Organization and other other authorities, but the scientific community itself in some ways has been resistant to the development and dissemination of evidence that that doesn't match the the sort of the majoritarian view. Yeah. Um, 
which is a very strange, I think, position for science to be in. Not one I've, I'm used to or I've seen in my career. So I, I had a great case of it the other day, uh, a, a, a PhD uh, medical doctor um, telling me that uh, in, infections and cases were one and the same. And we've, we, have, we haven't done enough serology testing in South Africa to make the claims you're making, you know. Um, there's a hundred studies now and they're all say a very, very similar story. Like the case fatality rate is not equal to the infection fatality rate. It's off by at least a factor of 10, maybe higher, depending on how much testing you're doing. Um, yeah. And so, and, and so, and the infection fatality rate looks like it's about 0.2%. Well, you know, I just, it, it's, it's a very, maybe 0.3% worldwide from these studies. It, it's, um, you know, some places where there's high density seems to be a little higher. Most of the rest of the world seems to be much lower. Africa is much lower. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, so it's, it's striking um, to see people basically ignore this now vast amount of scientific evidence that, that paints such a different picture of the epidemic um, than, the, than, than sort of the media portrayals and, and sort of what we come to, come to know. We tell us that the story of the epidemic then is uh, of the disease is that there's huge uh, range of clinical presentations. Mm -hmm. You know, 30, 40 percent experience nothing at all from infection. Literally, they're asymptomatic. You wouldn't call them sick, mm -hmm. and, except that they're PCR positive. And, and then um, a very a small fraction of the population gets this very severe pneumonia and, and, and unfortunately dies from it. Um, and the rest, it's somewhere from a mild, mild case, mild cold to a, a, a much more severe cold. I mean, that's what, that's a very, very wide range of clinical presentations. We, and we think in our heads in, in this fear based way that we're all going to die from it. We're all going to end up with pneumonia. Yeah. 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 And it's clear that that's a, a, a very small minority of the, the so-called cases and an even smaller minority of the, the total infections. Um, where are you on this question of what percentage of in infections don't provoke an antibody response? I mean, I think it's a very small fraction. Don't provoke any antibody response. You have to have some sort of deficient immune system to have nothing. Um, I mean, there is, there's this question of how complete and how long lasting the antibody response is. And I think um, the, it's clear that the antibodies fade over time. Right. So the serology tests that I worked on early in the epidemic, uh, in some sense, are underestimating the total number of cases and overestimating the infection fatality rate. Because as, as time passes, it may be six months, I'm not sure exactly the number, but like I, still, I think there's still work being done on this. But it, it's very clear that a certain fraction of the population loses its antibody protection, uh, I'm sorry, antibody re response floating around your bloodstream. But at the same time, it's also becoming very clear that there are other immune responses, uh, you know, T cell responses and, and B cell responses that if you were to, to be challenged again with the virus would come into play if you were infected before. And, and, so, and these two, last long. We've got two immunologists on the team who both believe that there's, a, that there's a significant proportion of infections that would trip positive on a PCR test where the infection is so mild that um, the uh, the viral particles never presented to the lymph nodes. It's all dealt with at a cellular immune system level. Never provokes an antibody response, and they think that that it, that the, this could be quite a significant percentage. You have no time for that idea. Uh, no, it's I, I, that, that, I'm certainly open to that idea. I mean, I, I this I'm, I'm just reflecting what I've what I've read thus far. But I mean, there's still quite a lot we don't know about the immune yes. response. I, I think the the bottom line for me. As a, as a thinking with my, my health policy hat on, as opposed to the, 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 the medical hat on, is uh, if someone is infected a second time, mm. how likely is it that they're going to experience a severe outcome, mm. severe negative outcome? Mm. And I think the answer is within a, the first year, at least probably mm. longer, it's much less likely than the first time they were infected. Yeah, like, like orders of magnitude less. I think that's the, the punchline, the bottom line from all of this literature. Well, um, and you can see it, uh, how hard it is for the guys to find these anecdotes of people who've been reinfected in the first place, let alone gone on to get sick. Um, yeah. well, there's like, I think, well, there's one, ca one case study I saw where there was a, a more severe infection, but the, the, the gentleman had a immune, a, a sort of basically immune deficiency disease. Yeah, there was, um, also, there was also a woman with, who was on uh, cancer uh, treatment, you know, um, yeah. 
but for the, but like the vast majority, I mean, I think there's now just, I mean, I, I, somewhere on the order of 30 or 40 cases. I mean, I haven't kept track of the full literature, but like it's, it's all, it almost always appears much less severe. And we're yeah. talking 30 or 40 cases in the, in the literature compared to like, I think over a billion people have been infected thus far worldwide. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very clear that we have relatively long lasting and relatively complete immunity after infection. Okay, I'm going to ask one, one. Now that we've discussed reinfection, we got to we got to we got to ask the question: Long COVID. Uh, this is another thing where I think the, the literature is evolving. Um, so you have this you have this case uh, you have this sense where 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 you get this sense from the media that everyone who gets COVID is going to going to have this disease forever. It's like HIV or or uh, or, or chickenpox or something. It lives in you forever or something. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the notion is, but it, it, the literature doesn't support that as yet. What what it does support is that there are some cases of extra respiratory infections. You know, there are some cardiomyopathies, there are some co coagulopathies, there are some um, some of these extra respiratory manifestations. That's true for the flu, by the way, right? So for the flu, uh, the there are extra respiratory manifestations of the flu. So um, uh, the, you know, my, my, my son uh, had the flu two, uh, three years ago, uh, despite having had the vaccine. Uh, and one morning, after a couple of days after I thought he was better uh, with the respiratory infection, he woke up and unable to walk. And my mind raced back to medical school to all of the, the, the rare things that can happen. And, and I was like, you know, Guillain-Barre, I was like, okay, my life and his life is about to change. And uh, it turned out it was beyond benign myositis. It's a rare thing that sometimes happens, it, and it resolves no, three years later. Years up the money. Yeah, and I was—I mean, obviously, I was relieved. Um, but so it's possible that there are some some longer-term expiratory manifestations. I, I read the literature, and none of the papers, not a single one of them, does a good job on the denominator. How fra how common is this relative to the number of people getting infected? It's mm -hmm. very likely, it seems to me, to, to be relatively uncommon. It's something we should take seriously, but we should not be placing this at the front of the public's mind as a likely outcome after you get COVID. Again, an example of bad public health policy. I mean, I, I listened, uh, Sinetra was uh, giving a presentation uh, in, 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 in last week, and there was this doctor who was just not taking no for an answer. As far as he was concerned, long COVID was the biggest problem in coronavirus, and 50% of young people were going to get it, and they were all going to. Then they need long COVID clinics, and they, you know, he was just like like a zealot. You know, it was not going to give up on this thing. And I know very well that there's an absolute paucity of information about this. You can't say very much for sure, other than that, as you say. It, it, there's nothing telling us that it looks more could be different from any other respiratory virus. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, do you have a theory about that? Why people are latching on to this? I mean, I, I, it seems like it's, it's, it's again, it's not something we should dismiss out of hand. I mean, it's something that's there, but it's and it's something we think about. But it's something um, that we shouldn't base world-changing. It's, it's an additional cost we might add on yeah. to the the list of cost of COVID. But we should also have to compare that against the harms, the lockdowns, right? You have to compare benefit, cost and benefits when you're considering a policy. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I'd, I'd like to discuss this with you because I, I, it's one of the many times when a chill has gone down my spine and I looked at this person, you know, who was so adamant um, that there was this bogeyman. And I thought, what's wrong with you? You know, you must surely understand what you're doing. And, and I mean, it's not like this was just a, a sort of a five minute isolated story. We, we have this ministerial, ministerial advisory committee that was advising the government on its policies. And the version of the story as we had it was that there were a couple of scientists in that group. Um, and they were well known scientists. I, I had a high regard from them before even coronavirus. Uh, they'd, they'd done amazing work in South Africa on AIDS and that kind of thing. And uh, we, when we, we felt that they were maybe the voices of moderation, but we weren't sure because they had restraining order, not, you know, non-disclosure agreements and that kind of thing, preventing them from speaking in public. When those scientists were thrown out of that advisory committee, we thought, oh, good, because they will actually, will actually be able to hear what they really think. What did they do? First article, long COVID. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. I wanted to throw something. You know, here they come. We were going to hear about how we advised them not to lock down or we advised them to keep the schools open and they didn't listen 
or we were telling them that this is not such a big event and that the fatality rates are much lower, or the susceptibility is lower. Something sensible, please. No. Even the ones who were too radical for the government <laughs> were on this on this story, and I was just so disappointed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 strange. Like all of the uh, all of the majority sort of focus, even within the uh, with the scientific community, has been, has been in the service of ginning up panic yeah. when the data aren't there. So it's like this: you have this range of uncertainty in the scientific literature. I mean, the science is right. We we don't know the answers to many many questions. There's a range of possibilities, and every single one focuses on the worst case. And, and, or, and it's it's a very strange thing. Like normally, scientific communication explains the range of uncertainty, says here's the most likely thing, and then focus your attention on the most likely thing. Yes. And yet, somehow, science communication is now latched on to the worst case for every single COVID-related infection idea, and then the best case for every single lockdown-related idea, lockdown harm-related idea. Yeah, and, and there's also this idea that the only thing that can possibly affect uh, an epidemic curve is whether the country locked down and how well. Oh, that's 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 also crazy too, right? I mean, yeah. I think, um, like, if you think about lockdowns, they're complicated things. Like, societies are complicated. They're not, it's not like you say, it's not like you think of yourself a lockdown, you think of a, uh, let's take a whole, you know, sort of whole set of rats and put them in cages, individual, move the cages apart, and they won't in infect each other. That's the mental picture that people have in their heads of lockdowns. Mm -hmm. But that is not what an actual lockdown looks like in a human society. What an actual lockdown looks like is people congregate together scared, um, mm -hmm. they start to get depressed. Uh, a f uh, the, 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 the rich ones can sit in their home s apart from everybody else while the poor people come and give them food and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and other goods. Uh, we, we declare the, the, the ones that are giving the goods and, and services essential, uh, the ones that are, that are, that are being serviced uh, non-essential, mm -hmm. uh, kind of, you know, sort of war of the world like in an in a HG Wells sense. It's, it's, and, and, and uh, you know, we, 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 none of that takes into account who actually is vulnerable from the disease, you know, it's older people with chronic diseases. We just say, look, uh, if you're rich and you can afford to lock and you don't, you don't lose your job, you can do it on Zoom, lockdown. Good, uh, stay safe. Everyone else, while well, you're essential, if you're a 64 year old grocery clerk, go out there, go get, uh, go, go get exposed to COVID or don't feed your family, one or the other. Okay, so I've got it. Let me, let me try and uh, test you with a theory on the psychology of this kind of doctor or this kind of scientist. I, I try to, because I've stayed awake really nights nice trying to understand, you know, how do these people get into this state? Uh, because I don't, they're not bad people, you know, they're not trying to do bad. I don't think that, you know, I don't even really believe that there are such things as evil people, you know. So how do they get there? And it starts for me with, they actually got scared at the beginning. They were one of the many who were afraid for a long time. Then they are confronted with evidence that they don't, that doesn't support the, the narrative that they had absorbed. And they start to, they start to take that on, but they still need something that justifies their original set of reactions. They can't, they can't deal with the idea that they were part of the problem. So it migrates. It's no longer that it's going to be uh, 2,000 deaths per million, you know. Okay, we accept it's 200, uh, talking on a worldwide basis or whatever. Um, they accept that, but long COVID, you know, and or because of lockdown, you know. So irrational things creep in that, that allow them to still preserve a sense of uh, self-worth, in a way that to to rationalize the original panic yeah i think there is i think there's some of that i mean like that's just normal human nature right nick i mean that's not i i, I have a lot of sympathy for that like I, I if i'm honest with myself when I, I take a position that i think is true and i start to see evidence against it, my first instinct is oh no that can't be right because i was right to begin with the, what's what's psychologically weird is that it's lasted despite the self, the, the harms of these policies, the, the enormous catastrophic harms of these policies. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a limit to that. I mean, so, so, 
you know, we're human, right? And we just, I, I, you got to have some sympathy for people uh, around that. But I, but I, like, I, but I agree with you. It's like this, this desire to say I was right to begin with, as if that were the most important thing, instead of what should we do now based on the evidence we've, we've developed so far, right? That's how you make good policy. Sure, but I mean, but, I, I, but just to continue the theme, the harms thing doesn't even stop them. Because what they say is, no, those harms are there because of the virus. The lockdown didn't do anything incremental to those harms. Yeah, but but the lockdown did do so, did solve the, the did flatten the curve did did, yeah. did 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 crush. I mean, I think it's it's the same thing. I was like, it, it's it's like the worst case yeah. for every the virus can do to you, and the best case for everything the lockdowns can do. It's it's a very weird sort of. Uh, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make sense from a policy point of view to make those kinds of mix of, of, of assumptions. Uh, you just doesn't. Um, and, and and I think the range of uncertainty now is closing. Like if the lockdowns really did nothing, then why have them? Right? If they really don't have any of these harms. Why have them? I think it's it's you know if you close businesses, you close schools, you close churches, and you say you can't, and you put the fear fear that. Every, to, and to every single human on the face of the earth that if you interact with one another, you're going to kill each other. Um, how can that not have enormous consequences? That is not actually a reasonable hypothesis to maintain. And the evidence is overwhelming against that. Yeah. Well, talking about that asymptomatic transmission. Uh, I, you know, I, I said yes until I saw that ch study out of China with the 10 million, uh, temp that, that contact tracing study out of China, which looked like there wasn't any. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know. We'll see. I guess we'll still see. I think there's, I don't know. What, what do you think, Nick? My gut has always told me that Fauci was right at the beginning when he said it's unusual. Uh, would be, you know, it's not characteristic of respiratory viruses, uh, not, not the main driver of an epidemic. I think he was right when he said that. I don't know what happened since then, but yeah, I, I, I do think I do think I agree with that. I mean, I think it's even if it's uh, happens, people mm -hmm. who are asymptomatic are much less efficient at spreading it. That that much is clear. And then maybe it doesn't happen. I mean, that China there's 10 million people, 3000 contacts. None of them had. I mean, I just here's, here's what I think. I, I think the original Chinese papers purporting to demonstrate that asymptomatic transmission happened were bogus. And I think this pa this paper is bogus, too. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody tests 10 million people in uh, two weeks at 700,000 a day, comes up with a, a positive result that's below even the, the operating or, 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 sorry, the mechanistic false positive rate of the test being conducted. You know, <laughs> they're, they're trying too hard, you know. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 you know, uh, that would have been better. Then I would have said, okay, <laughs> but, but it's too low. And, and you so I, I so much want this to be the answer because I've believed for a long time that this was the bogeyman. You know, the, it's the yeah. asymptomatic idea that the idea that you could be harboring a deadly virus that could kill granny and therefore you mustn't go near granny. That's the evil part for me. You know, yeah. uh, I don't believe that this is the case. It doesn't make sense. You must have to have at least some mild topical infection to, you know, to, to cause you to yeah so I, I was, oh, now I see why Nick you're asking me about the uh, the antibody response right if 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 uh, if it doesn't actually induce uh, a response maybe the virus is already dead and so I can go near my mom who's 80 years old and I'm not going to infect her as long as I have no symptoms that's enough floating around in the back of my head is that but I also yeah. look at it as whether the denominator isn't uh, in fact a, a good deal better bigger than the serology tests are demonstrating. Um, but if that yeah. is the case, I would also admit that that might well be the case for other diseases. So if, if from comparability perspective, it probably makes sense to use serology as the denominator. But I just, you know, from complexity point of view, if we had to respond to every virus that entered our bodies with, uh, with an antibody response, that would seem to be energetically too taxing. And so we must have mucosal cellular level responses that can deal with an infection without stimulating a and a full-throated antibody response. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. Like, like I think I, that thought has crossed my head on children, right? Yeah. So why are children responding so much better to the virus than others? Like they must have some some mucosal immunity that that protects them, so that they don't even induce a response at all. Yeah. Uh, and and also this this very interesting data about how children pass the disease on at are much less efficient at passing the disease on than, than, than older, older people. I mean, it's, it's striking and we don't really have a good answer for that, but, but it must involve something like that. Um, we know that happens. 
right? But we know that it's yeah. true. Children are not spreaders. Although strangely, Fauci is, has uh, put the fear of God about that into people as well. Uh, oh. it's, it's the epidemic. Oh no, and then and then they masking two year olds and that kind of thing. I I just find it. Uh, oh, that's heartbreaking. Beyond all description. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 there was, uh, Sinatra also pointed out to us that there was an a, a stu a interesting study where the number of children in a household, as that number goes up, your, your likelihood of infection goes down. So I, I go straight to the explanation being that there's enough in common between this uh, coronavirus and other ones that are generally circulating and having those little brats around at school who, who routinely infect themselves with mild versions of uh, SARS-2 um is is protective you know that you yeah, no i mean i think I'd like you know it's, it's kind of kind of circle back around to this because it, it, it brings up a bigger question to me yeah why did we at the start of the epidemic assume we knew nothing about this virus no, why didn't we yeah. how do we start with like what do we know about immunology up to now and yeah. what how yeah. what's the like i mean we might be proven wrong but at least make decisions around a, a reasonable prior not a not a prior that assumes literally no knowledge whatsoever this could be hiv i heard yeah. you know um, oh and and the, the i mean it, the the low susceptibility was evident in march i'm sorry but when sweden didn't crack through the ceiling and blast off to mars and when the diamond princess numbers came in it was clear that that susceptibility was not 100% um and that's and that can only be not new and and i ask you know this is where talking to these ecologists is so useful because they, they don't, when you ask them the question, they don't turn around to you and give you the reason why this virus isn't new. What, what do they say? They say, there's no such thing as a new virus in the wild. Evolution, you know, there's no such thing. Yeah. You can make a new virus in the lab one day in the future, maybe. But in the wild, things evolve slowly. And so our systems have seen them and the pace of evolution is very slow. We've probably had coronaviruses around us since before the existence of man, you know. Um, and so we've got a, there's a complex co-evolution that's happened between ourselves and viruses. And yes, the system that protects us from them is subject to all of the same things that our other systems are when we age, you know, but to describe any virus as new, they say is just a, they can't, they can't intellectually, they cannot accept that idea. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I learned from talking to Sinetra is, and it's just fascinating, is that, is that uh, she, she thinks of the, the whole, uh, uh, our interaction with viruses as, as adaptive, right? So we, we, uh, the, one of the reasons why we live so long is because we're such an interconnected society that we are, our, our bodies are exposed at, at, often at young ages to the, a much wider range of these viral pathogens mm -hmm. and we've learned to cope with it. Whereas like in, in, when people traveled less, the world was less interconnected, there was a narrower set of things they were exposed to. And so when they, when they traveled outside, they would, they would get exposed and all of a sudden, you know, have a, have a very severe negative reaction to it. Um, in a sense, the, the interconnectedness of the world itself protects us from the viruses, which is like the opposite of the lockdown idea. Yes. Like we create... Like we're essentially like created... Like we, we maybe at best, we've... We, we, gain some short-term benefit. I'm not even sure about that at the expense of this, like reversal of this, like huge modern benefit of, of, uh, of protecting ourselves from, from uh, viral threats. That, that, when I heard that argument as well, I, I, was, I added it to my growing list of um, <clears throat> reasons why you shouldn't lock down. Um, but it reminds me of one that I wanted to just mention uh, and, and see what, see what your thinking is. I listened to a scientist talking the other day, uh, debating the other day with Martin Kudorf. And um, uh, I was, I didn't, I didn't like the way the guy engaged. He was very ad hominem and very uh, kind of uh, a little bit offensive. It wasn't a sincere scientific debate. It didn't strike me. Um, and I was chatting about it to one of the scientists in Panda. And he said, oh, you should see this paper that guy wrote. He sent me the paper. What does the paper argue? It says, I think I can even remember the wording verbatim, uh, counterintuitively, in diseases that have uh, significantly age-graduated mortality, lockdowns can worsen mortality. In other words, the, the intellectual architecture of the Great Barrington Declaration is in a paper that he'd written in 2011. Huh? This is Mark Lipsitch's paper. I know, I, I know the paper. I actually debated with Mark. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say about that.
I, I think I think it's uh, there are a lot of people who have changed their minds in March. A lot of very very smart people who change their minds about what to do in March, and they uh, what I would like to do is get them to change their minds back. Um, but I, but I think it's more it's even beyond the scientists. Really, it's it's the public at large that we need to we need to reach, and explain and help them understand that the fear that they have that they're acting on is hurting them, that the actions that they're that they're taking are not. I mean that they that they think are moral, in order to I don't go see my mom at all or 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 I you know I, I have my two year old wear a mask. They think of it as moral actions because they 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 they're not familiar with the science what the scientific literature actually is saying, yeah. um, but you're just acting in a moral way because they've been told based on this fear that they that they, this is the thing to do. I think we have to reach those folks yes. beyond just the scientists. I think yes. at this point. So, so for me, I've been trying to test various ways of explaining the idea of uh, that, that when you're not around granny, not wearing a mask is helping granny, you know, <laughs> or not, not being locked down is helping granny because you, you get to the herd immunity without putting vulnerable people in the exposed group, you know. Uh, the, you know the hard part about that, Nick, is that is the is the fear of the disease, right? So, yeah. uh, do I am I scared to get coronavirus? Or am I scared that my kids would get coronavirus? I, I I am not scared that my kids would get coronavirus at all. Yeah. Uh, I, and, and my mortality, if I looked at a risk calculator the other day, I'm 52 years old with uh, relatively healthy. I mean, it's about 0.2 uh, percent of exactly the yeah. median for the IFR for the world, right? So, um, do am I scared of a 90, 90 a, a disease that has 99.8 percent survival rate? For, I mean, frankly, no. I'm, I, I, but I can understand other people who might have different risk preferences. Yeah. Than me. But I think that's coming down. I think people are dialing that fear down. I don't know what it's like in America, but in South Africa, you know, if you took me two months back, people were all terrified. They can't understand why I'm not worried about going into one of the townships or visiting a hospital. You know. It's um, still the fear is still here in the United yeah. States and the media. Yeah. And, you know, actually, there was this recent study that did an analysis of the, the press coverage. The American press coverage has been relentlessly negative, far more so than mm. more so than the international press coverage. Mm. And uh, with the cases rising, it's come back to almost to March levels. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I, the way I put it to people is I'm actually more scared of not getting it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I want to make sure I get it. So you know, sometime in the next five years, so that when I'm uh, when I'm 85 and more decrepit than I am now, uh, that I don't get it then. You know, for the first time. Um, I think that. I think that's. I think that's wise. I mean, of course, you know, the other the other thought people have in their head is, well, why don't we just wait till the vaccine? Um, no. And you know, in the early days of the epidemic, I mean, I, I know about vaccine development or work on vaccine safety issues. Vaccines, I thought, take 10 years to develop. Uh, it's it is actually remarkable that we have what four or five vaccines that that look promising uh, so quickly, mm. uh, in, in 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 a, in a sense. It's look, it's, I mean, it's it's actually it's kind of surprising right, in many ways. Like we we have this novel virus and we go to a vaccine in less than a year. Mm. Is uh, I mean, it'll, someone's going to have to write a nice history of that to explain how that happened. But it's um, exactly which the, corners it, were cut. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I mean, I, th I think uh, the the safety, the, the the regulation of safety of it is is uh, in at least in the United States. One, if you're familiar, like it's it's it tends to be overly conservative. If anything, like it'll, it'll nix vaccines that are 99, you know, very very safe, just because of a, a few few things. So I think uh, it's if it gets approved, then it, it's I'm, I will have a. Lot, I mean, I'll look at the data, but I'll have a lot of confidence that it's safe. Yeah. Let me put this way: I, I would rather have my mom. Let's say it's as safe as it, I, I believe it's going to be, and. Uh, and as effective as it's uh, as, they're, as they're claiming for eighty-year-olds, then I'll, I'll recommend very strongly that my mom take it. Yeah. I'd rather have her have the vaccine than than COVID. Uh, than COVID. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm in the same boat. I, I'm not a by any stretch of the imagination an anti-vax person. Um, I I would like to see though that there's a little bit more recognition in the press of uh, commercial interests because there have been many cases over over time of. Uh, drug companies cutting corners and uh, burying ad, uh, adverse information. And uh, people haven't become angels overnight, you know? So let's retain some healthy skepticism. Let's make sure that, you know, the regulatory agencies are doing their jobs and not uh, providing rubber stamps on things they don't understand. Um, but other than that, I agree with you. I would, uh, you know, vulnerable people 
safe vaccine, go, you know. I, I resist this idea of the uh, universally mandatory vaccine. I think that's, that's not... Well, I think I think public health has not earned the trust enough of the public to get to to, to actually argue for that. I'd like because uh, you know if if we had a public health that didn't gin up fear unnecessarily, that hadn't ar argued for lockdowns as the only cure, hadn't ignored the enormous harms of lockdowns uh, that are evident all uh, and, and in many ways acted in ways that are contrary to good public health practice, we might have a chance of convincing people that uh, a mandatory vaccine would be the right idea. But um, no one's going to believe them. Yeah, if they say to do it, and actually, I agree with you. It's not a good idea at all. Like for for children, the vaccine, if it has even a small serious adverse event rate, will be worse than COVID. Sure. Why and, would you and, mandate? And there's nothing. I don't don't believe there's any theory that would suggest that the vaccine would provide better protection than than an infection. Well, it's certainly going to be less well tested. The range of uncertainty around that is be much greater than yeah. the protective protectiveness from COVID infection. Yeah, which we know a lot more about now than we yeah. Can. Yeah, and it's, just a strange uh, asymmetry in that is uh, the, the, you, what you usually find is that the people who are prepared to argue the case for long COVID are not going to argue the case for the absence of, uh, for the presence of uh, long-term side effects on a, on a vaccine, you know, uh, they, they will, they'll have that thing signed off in a day, you know, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, in, in, the, in the process of getting to this point, have you stopped to think what it was that made you speak out whereas others didn't? I don't, I don't know. I don't know um, what that is. I, I, I felt an obligation almost from the first day I heard about the lockdowns that it, it, it felt like a, an abdication of everything I, I of, of every principle of public health that I believed I had of, of science that I believed I mean just it felt like health policy all of all of those things it felt like a violation of all of those right a concern for the poor a concern for uh, grounding decisions to to, to to tailor to fit fit the facts as narrowly as possible so that you would so you minimize harms from it right uh, you all of those violations of human rights on a grand scale um, I mean shutting down of schools I mean that that is still shocking to me. Our schools are still shut down, right? Yeah. We basically yeah. decided that that our children don't have a right to education, yeah. or this or this yeah. generation. I mean, I, I, it's, I think there was a lot of combination of things that that came together, along with, as I said, my 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 experience in 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 working on infectious disease policy, um, thinking that the science is not as solid as people say it is. Um, I mean, I think all of those things. I th I just felt like I I mean I have this position as a professor. What's it for? I mean, I have tenure. What's it for? If I can't, if I don't speak up on this, then what, I may as well just resign. Yeah. Are there people you find people in the in the university starting to uh, soften uh, and come across across the line, as it were, across the across the floor? Um, I mean, like I, I'm, I'm lucky in some in one sense to be at a university where there are a few people who have also spoken up. You know, sure. Johnny John and uh, Michael Levitt. Um, but, uh, and, and, but it, it, I say it like within Stanford, it's been, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's, it's starting to have, I mean, like, you know, Stanford voted, the Stanford faculty, uh, Senate voted to anathemize, uh, uh Scott Atlas, essentially yeah. excommunicate him. I mean, it's, it's, um, Stanford is a very strange place for, for, for scientific discussion right now. I don't, I think, um, there are people who are feeling that it's what's happened is wrong. It's, we've, we've basically silent scientific discussion on the critical topics at Stanford, but, but there's still a very large number of people who who are just, they're, they've solidified and, and, and are not. But I think other universities are opening up. I've had, I've had invitations from folks at Princeton to talk. Uh, I had a nice oh, round table okay. with Hopkins. Uh, JAMA invited me to a debate uh, with Mark Lipsitch. Uh, so I, I think the, the uh, yeah, there yeah. is this. I, I realize now I confused the debates. It was your debates, not Martin's. That that. Uh, oh, was, yeah. I mean, it's um, upset. But um, yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah. I, I mean, I think. I think it's. I mean, that. I think people are sensing that there is another point of view that's worth listening to. That we're not crazy. We're just seeing things, uh, the same evidence differently, and reaching different conclusions about the right policy. That I. I, I, th I think in a sense, Nick, there's a, there's like two norms at play here, that really conflict, and that really that that's part of the problem, right? So the scientific norm is one of 
uh, you know, science is dialectic. You say something, I say something. We disagree. We, we agree on an experiment to decide between us. We do the experiment. The experiment has some result, and mostly you're right. Uh, but then, like, you, we, we, so I change my mind a little bit, and then we then we come to new conclusions where we disagree. Hopefully, our, our disagreements are narrower. We do another experiment. Science evolves like a dialectic, and if there's any suppression of that disagreement, science cannot move. Yeah. Right. Say your position is is so far off that I'm not going to listen to you at all. I'm going to dismiss you out of hand as as a as a crank, and that's it. We're done with we're done with. And then there's no science, right? Yeah. And to say that for a lar a, a, a position where there's so much evidence, mm. lockdown harms, for instance, mm. just dismiss it out of hand, is is uh, it, you're, it's the end of science. You may as well just not not do science at all. Yeah. So that's that yeah. one norm of open discussion, open science, which is really really important that I think has been violated through this epidemic. Now, on the other side, there's the, there's the, there's the, um, uh, there's this public health norm of unified messaging. You know, you kind of need to tell the consensus. public, here's what's happening. Here's the right things to do. And there has to be some consensus, mm -hmm. right? Or else the public gets confused. Now the, there's a great responsibility there for public health officials to reflect truly the science when there's true uncertainty and debate about crucial issues in the science the public health messaging should reflect should understand that and not take a side immediately where it's they, where they where they gin up fear like that we just talked about we talked about the fear of the early days of the epidemic right mm -hmm. um they took a side on in this great uncertainty the worst case scenario and said let's act on this side mm -hmm. right and that's, I think that the, it's the violation of public health norms combined with the violation of norms and of open discussion and science. That's, that's a huge casualty of this epidemic. And I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I, I just hope that it's the, the institutions uh, that people lose respect for and not science itself. You know, I wanted, you know, it, it's a, it, at least the first, uh, but I'm hoping that uh, we don't find that we have a backlash against science in general, because that would be a truly disastrous thing. Um, yeah, I totally agree with everything you said there. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's a very interesting note to finish on. And I wanted to thank you very much for, uh, for sitting on Panda's uh, Scientific Advisory Board. It's been great. Uh, just as much as you get draw support from uh, colleagues at other universities, we draw an amazing amount of support in our work, knowing that there are people out there who are sort of over our shoulders and uh, making sure we don't uh, go too far astray. Um, so uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, thanks very much for a great conversation. Thank you, Nick. It was a real pleasure to be able to talk with you.